All right, confirmation students, uh, this is the video makeup lesson for your last uh, confirmation lesson of this confirmation instruction year. We're at unit 3.5. That means we're in the third round of five classes in the fifth lesson. Now you will have a lesson next week with Mr. Telke as he talks a little bit about some of our uh, worship practices and the liturgy. And that's a pretty relaxed lesson. It's actually really enjoyable. So don't, don't try to skip out on that. You'll want to be there and learn those things. Um, but as you recall, each of our three five-week units this year covered a different uh, person of the Holy Trinity. Uh, God the Father was in the first unit. God the Son was in the second unit. And we also learned about Holy Communion there. In this last unit, we spent three lessons learning about God the Holy Spirit. And now uh, these last two lessons of this unit on holy baptism. So last week we learned about uh, what baptism is. It's water along with the word of God uh, to forgive sins and bring us into the kingdom of God. And uh, what does it do? It rescues us from sin, death, and the devil and gives eternal life and salvation to all who believe. Uh, so our baptisms are a huge deal. They're the assurance of our salvation. They bring us into the kingdom. Today, then, we are going to talk about uh, the third and fourth parts of holy baptism, how baptism unites us uh, to Jesus Christ, and then also what baptism means for our daily lives. Many of you were baptized as infants, and you may think, what does something that happened so long ago and far away have to do with me? We're going to talk about that this lesson. Finally, then, we'll close with a review, something I put together a long time ago called uh, 12 questions every confirmation student should be able to answer about baptism. So you want to be on page 45 in your workbooks. You'll notice that's uh, the last page before the cover in the back, so it's easy to find, page 45. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and you can follow along with me. Um, there you see it. So we are on unit 3.5 daily dying and rising. Here we go. Um, if you look on page 45 in your workbook, we ask ourselves, how can water do such great things? You remember those four characteristics of a sacrament? They're I, V, F, W. Instituted by God, there's a visible element. The forgiveness of sins is given, and that fourth thing is the word of God is present. It's not magic water. It's not magic bread and wine. It's the word with the water and the word with the bread and wine that gives it the power. And that's what this part says here. Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with faith, which trusts in the word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. Anytime you jump in a pool, take a bath, splash yourself with water, that's not a baptism. It's the water with these words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so with the word of God, it is a baptism, that is, I love these words, a life-giving water, rich in grace, a washing of new birth in the Holy Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, this is part of your memory work. I hope you take the time to memorize that. I hope you know that all your life with the word of God. It's a baptism, life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of new birth in the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to look down in your book. What is the meaning of baptism? It's right, uh, kind of near the top middle of the page. Um, it says, in baptism, we are united with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or we are clothed in Christ. This uniting of us with Jesus' death and resurrection, we call the mystical union, uh, kind of because it's a mystery how at our baptism, when water is put on us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are united with Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, if you think about baptism, this makes a lot of sense, especially in the case of a, a full immersion baptism. Uh, when someone's fully immersed, they, they go under the water, they drown, they die, just like Jesus was put to death and laid in the ground. But then uh, they come up from the water, they rise again, and they are a new man now. They're no longer part of Satan's kingdom, but they're part of God's kingdom. Uh, baptism unites us to the death, the dying, and the resurrection of Jesus. You say, well, Pastor, where does this in the Bible? Well, it's many places. Uh, Romans 6, 3 through 5. Look at that verse with me. It says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too would have newness of life. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection. That means if you've been united with Jesus' death and resurrection and baptism, that means when you die, just like Jesus was raised, you will be raised as well. That's the promise of your baptism. That's why at funerals, we read that very verse right there. We drape the casket in a baptismal pall to remind everybody there that this body laying in the casket that is now dead has been promised through holy baptism to be raised with Jesus. Colossians 2.12 teaches us this as well. Look at that verse. It says, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised Jesus from the dead. There it is again. Baptism uh, buries us with Jesus and raises us with him. And finally, Galatians 3.27, another way of thinking about it. All of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourself in Christ. Another translation says you have put on Christ. Now think about this here. Scripture says, when we're baptized, we're united with the death and resurrection of Jesus. We, we're clothed with Christ. It's a washing of new birth. Right? How can Scripture say all these things about baptism, and yet, and yet some church bodies don't, don't baptize infants, don't think baptism does anything. They think it's just a symbol, an empty rite, something you do out of obedience to God to show him that you're going to listen to his word. No, see, we see baptism as something much more than that. It's God's gift, God's working in our life, claiming us as his own. And every time scripture talks about baptism, it assigns this wonderful, wonderful language uh, to what's going on there. All right. Now let's talk about daily dying and rising. Uh, this is part four of baptism. So look in your book there. Um, oh, I forgot to change the slide when I was talking about mystical union. Um, there are those uh, verses there again. Um, part four of baptism. And this is the part that sometimes maybe Lutherans forget to emphasize, but I don't want you to miss out on it. What does such baptizing with water indicate? Luther says it indicates that the old Adam in us, and old Adam just means our sinful nature, the the sin we inherit because of Adam and Eve's sin. We are born sinful with an inclination to sin because uh, we're descendants of Adam and Eve. We're born into a fallen world. That's what baptism is rescuing us from. But notice what it says. Now, now baptism doesn't take away our sinful nature forever and ever. It still is with us till the day we die. It says it indicates that the old Adam, the sinful nature in us, should by daily contrition, that's being sorry, uh, and repentance, that's turning from our ways, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires. And that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. All right, that's the meaning of our baptism for every day. Not, not just that we died and rose again with Christ long ago when we were baptized, but that every day is a day to live baptized to wake up and say the sinful desires in me, the things that want to go against God's will, I'm going to drown those today. And I'm going to let the new man that lives in me through the Holy Spirit rise up. And that's the person that's going to live today. Um, so um, let's talk about then the task of baptism. That will be down there at the sort of near the bottom of page 45 in your book. Baptism saves. We taught that very clearly last lesson. But you can fall away from your faith. Just because you're baptized doesn't mean it's a, a get into heaven uh, ticket that lasts forever. You can throw that gift away. You can reject God's gift. And the way to think about this is like a baby being born. Um, baptism is a new birth of our spirits. But what happens if you take a baby home, put it in the crib, and never feed it, never care for it? It would die. You can't live without being fed and nourished and cared for. And that's the same thing with our faith. When we're baptized, it's like a baby being born. It's like our faith being born. But if we don't feed that faith, if we don't go to worship, if we don't hear God's word, if we don't live in fellowship with the community of believers, that faith can get weak and weak until it can ultimately die. How do you feed your faith with God's word? 
Now, if you were ever to lose your faith, decide you don't believe in God someday, and then and then later on wake up and 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 want to come back to the faith, you would not need to be rebaptized. You see, because remember, it's God's work in your life, and He He does not get things wrong. Um, I heard one time about a man who went to the Holy Land in Israel and got some water out of the River Jordan and brought it back with him to America, and went to his pastor and said, "Pastor, I want to get rebaptized with this water." Uh, the same water Jesus was baptized with. Now, think about that for a minute. That water has evaporated into the clouds and rained down and evaporated in the clouds uh, millions of times since Jesus walked the earth. It's not exactly the same water. Um, but nevertheless, um, the pastor told the man, no, because you see, you don't ever need to get rebaptized. If, if someone was baptized as a Catholic and then they become a Lutheran later on in life, we don't rebaptize them. Um, God gets it right the first time. He, he never walks away from his promise. You may walk away from the promise, but if you come back, his promise stands firm. Uh, also, Ephesians 4, 4, and 5 kind of teaches this. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, what if someone dies before they are baptized? Um, you don't just automatically go to hell because you weren't baptized. Uh, look at Mark 16, 16 there. It says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Believes and is baptized, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It doesn't say anything about not being baptized and being condemned. And the reason for this is while baptism begins our faith or confirms our faith in those who believe, uh, you can come to faith in other ways. You can, if you're an adult, uh, who's never been baptized or never heard about Christianity, and, and, and someone teaches you the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, and you believe in that, you are saved at that, at that moment. And, you know, yes, baptism should follow. But if you don't make it to baptism, it's not like you're automatically damned to hell. Uh, think about this, you know, a person comes to faith, they've got the baptism scheduled uh, for Sunday morning church, and they're crossing the street to church from the parking lot, wham, they get hit by a semi and killed. Well, it's, it's not as if God uh, hasn't already worked in their life through the hearing of the word. So you say to yourself, well, if I already believe and I, I don't happen to be baptized, why do I need to get baptized? Well, uh, that's still a way God works in your life in that moment concretely. It still gives you something to hang on to when, when the years go by and your faith doubts or you're worried and you wonder, does God love me? You always have that promise, but he baptized me. He claimed me as his own. Uh, and that's something uh, we want to talk about daily, assurance and remembrance. Remember your baptism every day. It tells you who you are. You're a child of God now. To whom you belong, you belong to Jesus. Uh, die to your old self each new day and live to Christ. If you ever have any doubts, if you ever wonder, does God love me? You can always remember that you're his baptized child. I tell people, like, if you take a shower in the morning or if you wash your faces, that water splashes you, Right? Have that be a reminder of your baptism. Do you think that would make a difference how you go out your day if before you leave the house every morning, you, you mentally thought about the fact that, hey, I'm baptized. I'm a child of God. I'm different. I got to go live my life different than the rest of the world. Uh, remembering that each morning can be a, a huge reminder. Um, we're not going to do this at the bottom. Uh, uh, article, How to Defend Infant Baptism and Have Fun Doing It. Um, I may make that available for those who are in class to take home after class and to read, perhaps. Um, normally, I might take some time to do that, but we're just going to, we're going to omit that here on the video. So turn the page uh, to page 46, page 46, and I'm just going to go through uh, this list of questions here, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen a different way with you so that you can follow along with me. Um, and I just want to uh, kind of rifle through this. This is what I hope uh, every student could know um, when they're done with their baptism instruction and confirmation. So let's just go through these here to, as a way to wrap up the video, then we'll get into your journaling assignment. So what is baptism? It's water combined with God's word, specifically in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit at his command. So water visible. W, word of God, command, institution, I, to save souls, there's that forgiveness of sins, I, V, F, W. Why baptize? Well, Jesus commanded the church to baptize. 
that's one reason to do it, but it's not the only reason. We are all in need of the forgiveness of sins that baptism offers. Young and old, infant and adult, if you haven't been baptized, you need it. What does baptism do? It saves us from sin, death, and the power of the devil and grants us life and salvation. Pretty amazing stuff. You know, somewhere along the line, you're going to encounter a, a friend or a roommate or uh, that is a very, very devout Christian. But they are not going to share the belief with you that baptism is anything more than an empty rite. Don't ever let them talk you out of the promise of your baptism. What gives baptism its power? We just talked about that. The words uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whose work is baptism? It's God's work. He normally performs this uh, circumcision of the New Testament through pastors. Uh, but any Christian can baptize in the case of an emergency. Who needs baptized? All nations everyone, adults, children, all people. Why are infants baptized? Well, they're born with original sin and need forgiveness. The church baptized infants from the very start. Entire households in the New Testament come to faith. Uh, the earliest church fathers teach that infants were baptized. And I'm going to scroll up here. Why are adults baptized then? We just got done talking about that. Adults who have come to faith are baptized so they can have the same assurance that everyone else has who's been baptized. What's the proper mode of baptism? Um, baptizo means to wash or sprinkle. There are many practices that are valid. Uh, the Lutheran Church usually practices the sprinkle method where water is, is sprinkled on the head. Some churches may practice full immersion. Uh, we talked about how that's very symbolic of the killing of the sinful nature and the rising up of the new Christian, but it is not required for a baptism to be valid. What is required is the word of God and water. If baptism saves, why do some lose faith? Well, like we said, baptism grants new life, but that life needs to be fed with the word of God or it will eventually die. That's why keeping coming to a church after confirmation is so important for those of you who this is your last year. This is not graduate and never have to worry about Sunday morning commitments again or anything like that. This is just the beginning of your life of faith. What about rebaptism? We talked about that, never necessary. God's work, he gets it right uh, no matter when it occurs. Yes, we can walk away from that promise, but he never does. What if you die before you're baptized? We just talked about that as well. Uh, baptism plus faith saves, but only unbelief, only non-faith damns to hell. Baptism is not absolutely essential, but it does give us the greatest assurance of our salvation. And then finally, what does baptism mean for you each day? Uh, four things. You should daily remember your baptism. It's a reminder of who you are. You're a Christian. You're a child of God. It's a reminder to whom you belong. You're not your own anymore. God sealed you with his Holy Spirit. He claims you. You're his child and not Satan's. And finally, lastly, it's your assurance of salvation in every time of need. I'll tell you one last story. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, once before he was maybe going to be excommunicated from the church, was very much wondering uh, whether he was within God's love or not. And the night before he has to give an answer, um, he is tormented. Says he feel, felt Satan's hot breath breathing down his neck. That's how he felt. Uh, but the one thing that assured him in that moment is he said, but I am baptized. I am your child. You have made me your own. He took great comfort in that. And I hope you will take great comfort in your baptism uh, your entire life. All right. Um, now we're going to introduce your journal activity. Um, there is no uh, huddle today. Uh, I didn't design one. We kind of ran out of room at the end of our book here. <laughs> um, but you're going to go ahead and look on page 47. It's the last numbered page in your workbook. Um, again, finishing up our treatment of the book of Psalms and understanding better how the whole Bible points to Jesus, and in particular, how the Psalms point to Jesus. The Psalms are quoted more in the New Testament than any book. Um, Many times they sound like they're talking about Jesus, even though they were written long before that, and that's because they pointed ahead to him. So take a look at the following four verses that are printed there and say how they point to Jesus. So Psalm 2-7, Psalm 110, 1, 118, 22, and 23, and 118, 26. Uh, here's how Pastor Roland wants your answers to look. 
Uh, for instance, he gives you an example there in Psalm 173, 2. It says that God's son likes to ride bicycles, and that reminds me of a time when Jesus rode a bicycle into Jerusalem. If you're wondering when that happened, uh, don't wonder anymore. It didn't happen, nor is Psalm 173 a real verse because there's only 150 Psalms, but that's what it's supposed to look like. So, you know, Psalm 2 7, what does it say there? And what does that remind you of in Jesus' life? Again, if you've got a Bible with cross references, that may be of great help to you. Um, you might, it might point you to a verse in the New Testament that jogs your memory just a little bit. All right. Okay. Well, um, if you're getting this email, uh, your last home huddle will be attached, but also a quiz that you're supposed to be taking uh, on the third article of the Creed and its meaning. You may study right up until the time you're ready to put pen to paper, but after that, it's no notes, fill in the blank. Uh, please bring that with you next week to your last confirmation lesson. It won't be any instruction there, anything for you to do other than to listen to Mr. Talkie talk about worship. So God's peace to you. It's been a great year. Eighth graders, you made it. You've got a few lessons in the fall leading up to confirmation in late October. Uh, seventh graders, I'm sorry, seventh graders, your last year. Sixth graders, it's been good to have you. You've only got one more year to go now, and you'll be, you'll be a confirmed member of the church. It's been my joy to teach you. God's peace and have a great day.